Okay, welcome everyone. I see that people have come into the room already. Um, so, um, so welcome everyone. Good day, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a, we will start in the, um, we can start now, I suppose. So this is a, a special issue webinar, um, which is um, uh, based on the power report cards for a special issue in APAC, the Adaptive Physical Activity Quarterly. Uh, the webinar is hosted by the University of Eastern Finland, and uh, we have cooperation from IFAPA, Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance, and also XP as well. Uh, so I'd warmly uh, like to welcome you to, to this event. Uh, my name is Kwok Ng, and I'll be um, uh, uh, giving some presentations as well. So just uh, some housekeeping rules or housekeeping tips. Uh, we're in a webinar mode, which what that means is that we have two options in terms of interactions. You can use a chat function and you can use the Q&A. So with the uh, Q&A is where you can put your questions and and answers to questions uh, that you might see fit in that section there. And that means that people can see it's all, people can write questions and you can also vote up questions that you feel is important to, to raise and you have a shared opinion on. And you can also comment on those questions. So if you feel like you want the question expanded, you can also uh, comment on that as well. The other interaction function we have is the chat function on the right-hand side. And uh, it's visible for everyone to see, and uh, you should be able to uh, send a message to everyone. So uh, you're more than welcome to try it out, and you can introduce yourself. Um, and for example, you might want to say your name and what country you're from and what organization you are in. And um, by all means, uh, uh, use this freely uh, throughout the event. So just a reminder, if you have questions throughout the presentation uh, to put, use the Q&A section. And uh, as part of the schedule, um, we will have the Q&A section at the end of the allocated time for this webinar, which is a 90 minutes webinar. So to begin, we will have some opening words from uh, our, our guests, and then we'll have a presentation by myself. Then I'll show some short country videos, um, provided by the uh, co-authors and then uh, we finish off with another pre-recorded video from um, from uh, Professor Shaika Hustler. Then we have uh, Catherine Carty from the UNESCO chair as a discussant to also discuss about um, uh, th this special issue and then we finish off with the questions and answers. Okay so uh, without further ado we shall move forwards and um, uh, and I'd just like to ask uh, Justin Hagel to uh, to, to uh, provide some opening words to this. Thank you. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> well thank you, Kwok, for the uh, for the opportunity to say a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, I want to congratulate Kwok as well as all of the authors uh, for the papers in this special issue. Um, you know, APAC being the international. Journal of Record for Adapted Physical Activity. It's certainly the place, the most appropriate place oh, yeah. for an issue like this to be published. And, um, and I'm happy to see it come out, um, hopefully this upcoming summer. I also think it's important to recognize a few other people who uh, worked more behind the scenes, including um, one of our associate editors, Kelly, uh, our former editor, Jeff, and then Christina and Julia, who work for Human Kinetics and are integral to um, APAC and the processes behind the scenes. Um, but congratulations to everybody again, um, and thank you for choosing APAC for the special issue. Thank you, Justin. Uh, most appreciated uh, to have you here to give us some opening words on this. I would like to move forward to uh, the next uh, opening words. Hi there, I'm David Legg, President of the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the Paris Sport Card Report. This is a long time in its making, it includes 14 countries from five of the IFAPA regions. 
And I also want to give special thanks and shout out to APAC for providing this open access opportunity for people from around the globe to read these reports and really be a part of this landmark opportunity. Uh, my sincere congratulations to Dr. Kwaking, my colleague and friend from Finland uh, for leading the charge on this. I'm sorry, I can't be there with you uh, during this launch. I think it's going to be four o'clock in the morning here in Calgary when we do so, but I will be with you in spirit and I look forward to hearing how the launch went. Congratulations and thank you again. Okay, so that was from the president of IFAPA and um, I just see some messages about the chat function being disabled. So we'll try to work on that to see if we can enable that. Um, next, uh, I'd like to, oh, we don't have uh, Salome here, um, but um, I'm sure she, she will be joining us in a, in a short while. But uh, if I can now move to uh, Yuri Sheffer from XP. Thank you very much, Juan. Professor Shaike Hutzler, past president of IFAPA. Professor Wognag, vice president of IFAPA. Catherine Curti, UNESCO chair and head of the trolley chair in Ireland. Dear distinguished participants and speakers. On behalf of the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, I have the honor to warmly welcome you all to the launch of Adapted Physical Activity Quarterly Power Report. Adapted physical activity has been always an area of interest and activity for me. As a graduate of the special education major at Wingate College for Physical Education and Sport, I also worked as a physical education teacher for those with special needs. I especially specialize in teaching to swim. I remember very well, and even though more than 50 years have passed, how I jumped in the pool when for the first time, one of my six years old students with special needs was able to swim alone. What an exciting event it was for her, for her family, and no less for me. How much this activity added to her self-confidence, to her joy of life, a great relief to her parents. Indeed, if physical activity is important and has been proven scientifically to contribute to the mental, physical, and intellectual health of children and teenagers, as well as to people of all ages. It contributes no less and possibly even more to those with special needs. Personally, I consider myself obligated both as president of ICSPE and as a human being to promote as much as possible and more the awareness, importance, and accessibility of adapted physical activity. XPA is a leader of the global movement educating for sustainable quality of life for all through physical activity and sport. We focus on integrating research to enhance physical activity and sport. Educate for improved quality of life and health for all people through physical activity and sport. And promote policies for active lifestyles, human performances, and good governance in physical activity and sport. Allow me now to take this opportunity and invite you all to our upcoming second panel discussion on global teaching excellence, namely how to teach sport, chaired by Professor Miki Shinovitz on April 14th, coming Friday at 2 p.m. CEST. For more information, please see our website or get in touch directly with our executive director, Dietlef Dumont. I wish us all a most enjoyable, interesting and fruitful webinar. Thank you, Uri. Um, very good to hear from you about your experiences. So if I just move to the next opening words, if I can come back to uh, Active Healthy Kids, because now we have uh, Salome uh, present as well. Welcome, Salome. Hi, hi, everyone. Um... Sorry, my Zoom decided to do an update <laughs> uh, just before I connected. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, okay. Well, so hi, I'm Dr. Salome Aubert and uh, I serve as the Vice President of the Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance and very happy to be here to represent it. 
And so briefly in two minutes, uh, we know now that like the, the benefits of physical activity for the health and well-being of children and adolescents have been recognized widely by the scientific community. And, and we know that they are potentially of utmost uh, importance uh, for the health and well-being of children and adolescents with a disability. Um, the report card on physical activity that have been developed by the Active Health Skills Global Alliance uh, as a tool uh, to advocate for the development of policies and programs that uh, will be effectively to hopefully eff effectively promote physical activity in children and adolescents around the world. Until two years ago, uh, only a few only a few report cards have been had been developed uh, with a specific focus on disability. Uh, so it was great and great to see then that last year, like 14 countries uh, uh, decided to join uh, this initiative, and this led to the led to this event today and to having the first para global matrix. Uh, on physical activity for children and adolescents with a disability. And if we look back a little bit uh, to how the global matrix started, like uh, in 2014, like the first global matrix had only 15 countries participating. So it was almost the same as what we have today. And it, ha it has now a demonstrated impact. And so this is uh, all like the same that we can hope with this initiative. And I'm excited to see uh, what the next presentation will show, and and this is how like uh, this is how like uh, we can like having this work done, having the report card prepared and presented and shared to the world, is the first step. And we should remember that uh, this initiative is like a, a great tool to try to advocate and to create change and to create uh, physical activity policies and make a have an impact. So uh, I'm happy to see. Uh, to see uh, the presentation and uh, that are upcoming now in this event. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. Thanks for your words and thanks for uh, for being being so supportive of this initiative, with this power report card. Um, so um, I really am very grateful to have everybody here presenting and giving some opening words on this rather important project. Um, I'm going to just give you a brief introduction <clears throat> to the power report cards and uh, and um, um, hopefully people here will get an understanding of of this. I believe I've made the chat function opening and working so please go ahead and check it and um, yeah so I would like to also give some acknowledgements before I get started with the introduction. So uh, first of all I'd like to acknowledge the APAC past and current editors and chiefs uh, Jeff Martin and Justin Hagel for for uh, for their support in this uh, in this initiative. Um, the APAC committee as well, which we had to convince to say that we can get a special issue in as well. Uh, appreciate that they were able to give their support for this, as well as for this special issue. We had the co-editors involved in this, and uh, and that was really really good to uh, to have them there. Um, I think one. One huge thank you goes to Human Kinetics, who have waived the uh, open access hardware processing charges, as well as having an awesome production team there as well. So um, this is going to be available to everyone to to read um, wherever they are around the world, without having to go to a paywall. Um, of course, the Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance committee members who have been very supportive of this initiative as well. Um, communications go back uh, quite a few years, so. This seems to be quite a, a nice um, uh, point to reach right now. And of course, acknowledgements to the country contributors, their research and publication teams who um, have demonstrated uh, uh, their, their work, their stakeholders who they got involved and, in, and the original data collectors who may not have or, or been um, acknowledged any previously. Of course, this is scientific work that have, have undergone Peer review. Um, so the reviewers have uh, were also instrumental in this, as well as for the grade auditing, which is one of the processes involved in the uh, in the in the creation of grades, and um, the of course the support of the FAPA board members and members of large who also um, supported this initiative as well. So, uh, in a nutshell, it's it's quite a lot of people involved in this, and I'm really thankful 
for everybody's support for this and uh, appreciate that their their work to um to to make this happen so a little bit with regards to the introduction i'd like to begin with a fact sheet that's come from unicef uh, that was recently published um and this was a collection of data from around the world and particularly with low middle income countries of um, the status of children with disabilities. And what you see here is uh, it's really openly available uh, is a report that was stating that it's uh, a starting point for understanding why investing in inclusive policies and programs can make a difference in the lives of children with disabilities, their families and communities uh, in significant areas related to dis disabilities. And their findings highlighted areas such as nutrition, assistive technology, digital technology, health, education, family life, and independent living. Now, what they found in, in much of the research and evidence that, uh, is that the children with disabilities had, uh, for example, were more underweight or they're overweight, they had reduced quality of life, they had low access to the digital world, that uh, they had low healthcare access, as well as there was unequal access for education. And their family life was also mixed between the amount of support that they have or did not have. So it's quite a comprehensive report. I do invite you to have a look at it, but I have a big but with regards to this report. And this but is that I find this is very useful, but there doesn't have to, there doesn't seem to be a fact sheet on the participation in, re in recreation, sport and leisure, which is still one of the uh, rights of persons with disabilities under Article 30. So they seem to be missing quite a, a a rather large area of information in relation to a fact sheet on children with disabilities. And what we see also evident in terms of the reports from UNICEF is that in, a, in another report which was seen, counted and included, which was using data from around the world to shed light on the well-being of children with disabilities, that they didn't have any report on uh, physical activity at all, despite having at least some pictures of people with disabilities taking part in physical activity. So there seems to be quite a big gap there. And I suppose this is one of the um, uh, reasons for why we, why we try to do this and, uh, and to be able to provide evidence to say that there is some type of data out there. So more recently, this may be because um, why we can get into this situation is because we've seen in, in the last couple of years, some initiatives that have uh, uh, shown globally some level of evidence of physical activity of people with disabilities. So first of all, there's uh, perhaps I should say that there is the WHO physical activity guidelines that for the first time included children with disabilities and or people with disabilities, should I say, but also there was the section on children with disabilities as well. And in addition to that, there was the United Nations Disabilities Physical Activity Reports from the Human Rights Commission, uh, published in 2021. And, uh, and uh, due to COVID-19, there was a, a slight delay in the Lancet Physical Activity Series, which also uh, reported uh, spe a specific issue on physical activity for people with disabilities. So timing-wise, I think this is the right time to be doing this. And um, But yet, we, the reports have talked constantly and repeatedly that there were large knowledge gaps on disability groups from different parts around the world, the type of activities around, as well as the opportunities for partic participation. So when we look at, for example, a model of, of looking at physical activity, we can look towards the, uh, uh, the report card system. And the report card system is not necessarily a new thing, it's been around for some time. And, uh, and one of the, and it began from 2005, where there's a report card on physical activity in children and youth in Canada. This then later on built into a, a global matrix of 15 countries in 2014. So almost 10 years ago, having 15 countries and it formed this um, Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance. And then uh, two years later, there was the version two of this. And I would just like to highlight um, a section from their paper which was saying that it was there was an obvious examination at country level report cards is that the lack of data and consequent discussion related to children and youth with disabilities, uh, similar to Global Matrix One. And so in response to this, we can see that in the Netherlands, there was a, a report card by their country that was that did a report card on Dutch youth with chronic conditions or disabilities, and they called that report card plus. 
and they called the title of it Unlimited Possibilities. In Global Matrix 3 in 2018, we saw that uh, there was two countries that included data with disabilities into their, uh, their report cards, uh, which was a, a big step going forward, uh, noting that it's only a small percentage of the countries that produced the report cards. And a year later, Hong Kong followed suited with uh, suit with, um, with their, their own uh, national report card on physical activity for children and youth with special educational needs. So last year, um, after some delays, we also saw Global Matrix 4 um, published from 57 countries. And in there also was recurring priority themes in physical activity, stating that uh, children with disabilities is under, uh, underrepresented in terms of the data, organized support and physical activity, uh, that the infrastructure for adaptive uh, for, um, needs to be adapted, and community environment um, is also um, uh, needs to be more targeted for children with disabilities. So what was the report cards in this sense? So, um, and just to, in a brief overview, uh, there are 10 indicators, so 10 different areas around physical activity. And uh, there are, uh, for each of these indicators, there are a set of benchmarks. And for each of those benchmarks, then the data gets graded. And based on these type of, these 10 uh, um, common indicators across the different countries, uh, the aims of the power report card were to demonstrate the current status of physical activity of children and adolescents with disabilities in each country and identify future directions. And as a result of that, we can try to summarize the international findings of disability data uh, on the physical activity as an extension and in parallel to a global matrix 4.0. And also then to attempt to capture as much of a global overview as possible and grouping them by the IFAPA regions. So something that you're going to uh, see in the next few videos is, uh, is, is the, the mention of grades. So what does grades mean? So what we have is a set of grades, like a, a report card. In a school report card, you might have a grade from A to F. And, um, and we have a similar type of um, output from here, where we have uh, A meaning that succeeding for the vast majority of children and adolescents with disabilities. So that would be about 80 to 100% meeting the benchmark, all the way down to F, where they're succeeding with few children and adolescents with disabilities, uh, being, meaning that the benchmark was met by less than 20% of children. And then there's a grade of um, INC, which is uh, whereby the countries have felt that there was inadequate evidence to grade. Okay, so hopefully this makes some sense when you see the next videos. In terms of the at the data that we collected and the recruitment, we went through a process of going through uh, different um, communication strategies to try to encourage as many countries as possible to, um, to get engaged in this process. And um, in the end, we were left with 14 countries that then uh, uh, are part of this special issue, uh, 12 of which provided brief reports. They were all asked to make adaptations to the benchmarks from the global matrix of the Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance, making the, the data specific to children and adolescents with disabilities, um, to also reconsider the physical fitness indica uh, um, indicator. So then uh, we can see what evidence there is because the normative values used in the general population might not be suitable, as well as we added an extra indicator with regards to the percentage of children with disabilities who have access to adaptive physical activity or sports equipment. The process of the of this special issue is that we uh, had it approved uh, by, by APAC. So we set out uh, in 2021, we had a call for papers in November, 2021, uh, with the aim to have brief report cards results with stakeholder interpretations. And that's the element of trying to find out the future directions from this information. Uh, in the new year, people were asked to collect, collate the information, convert the data to grades, and they were submitted uh, for external auditing. And then um, they went through an iteration process before they got accepted. And then they were asked to write up their manuscripts. So in a relatively short time, uh, they were able to generate uh, the papers for this special issue. So in this, for the remainder of this presentation, we have some short videos. Um, from uh, Canada, USA, Israel, Finland, Spain, Ireland, Lithuania, the Philippines, France, Brazil, 
South Korea and Hong Kong. And then we will finish off with some videos um, from, um, uh, from, from the last presentation. So just uh, make sure it is, this is all working. Hello, my name is Kelly Arbonikotopoulos and I'm from the University of Toronto in Canada. I'm pleased to present on behalf of my team, the 2022 Canadian Report Card on the Physical Activity of Children and Adolescents with Disabilities. In terms of the process that our team used, we graded 13 indicators using a 13 member panel of parents, community service providers, disability advisory committees and researchers with expertise in disability and physical activity, national surveillance and the global matrix processes. These indicators were graded using benchmarks of the Global Matrix 4.0. The available data sources included four nationally generalizable and representative data sets. We had two three-hour facilitated online panel discussions to appraise available evidence based on data gaps, opportunities, and recommendations. Here you see our grades. Overall, eight of the 13 indicators were graded and ranged from B plus to F. Five of the 13 indicators received a grade of incomplete due to there being an absence or, insu or insufficient evidence base to grade the associated benchmarks. With respect to the indicator of overall physical activity, several measurement gaps were raised by the Canadian panel. First was that the evidence base that we had used was limited to child and parent report measures in children and adolescents who experienced more mild to moderate impairments. The panel strongly recommend that valid instruments and multiple data collections be used for measuring physical activity participation of children and adolescents with disabilities to avoid a limited and biased representation of participation in this population. Secondly, the global benchmark for overall physical activity only focuses on quantity, specifically daily minutes of physical activity. The panel strongly recommend that there be greater focus on the quality of physical activity participation. And lastly, despite the indicator being referred to as overall physical activity, only moderate and vigorous intensity physical activities are considered within this benchmark. The panel also recommend that light intensity physical activity be considered within the benchmark for overall physical activity in future iterations of the global matrix. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you're interested to see our report card, you can download it using the QR code provided. Hello, my name is Heidi Stanish, and I'm very pleased to present the results of the first United States Para Report Card on behalf of our team that included Samantha Ross, Byron Lai, Justin Hagel, Jun Koo Yoon, and Sean Healy. Our team worked collaboratively and by consensus to review data sources and assign grades to the physical activity indicators. We would like to express our appreciation to the editorial board of the Adaptive Physical Activity Quarterly for publishing our work in the special issue. Our team made decisions at the outset of this project that would guide the process. We relied solely on peer-reviewed papers that used nationally representative data and were published in the last decade. We used only data sources that were derived prior to the COVID pandemic. We were decidedly conservative in our approach to assessing mixed findings to avoid inflating the grades. And lastly, we made an effort to align our approach to the larger U.S. Physical Activity Report Card for Children and Youth. The published reports that we reviewed for this project used two primary sources of national surveillance data in the United States. Those sources include the National Survey of Children's Health and the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Both of these national data sets have representation of children and youth with disabilities. There was sufficient evidence for us to assign letter grades to four of the 10 indicators. The remaining six indicators were incomplete. The grades were F for overall physical activity, D plus for organized sport participation, D plus for sedentary behaviors, and D for school-related physical activity. I'll focus for a moment on organized sport participation. The benchmark for this indicator is the percentage of children and youth with disabilities who participate in organized sport and or physical activity programs. The sources that we relied on to assign a grade primarily used the NSCH item which read, during the past 12 months, did this child participate in a sports team or did he or she take part in sports lessons after school on the week or on the weekend? The percentage of children and adolescents with disabilities answering positively to this item was used to assign here are some of the data points that we considered in assigning the grade for organized sport participation. 
While you can see there is variability in the percentages of those who participate, the overall percentage fell between about 34 to 39%, which is D+. Our team was faced with some challenges in developing the para report card. We found that there was insufficient data and questioned the relevance of the benchmarks and indicators for children and adolescents with disabilities. As such, we assert the following, a need to increase representation of children and adolescents with disabilities in US national surveillance efforts, a need to improve measurement tools, a need for targeted physical activity promotion strategies specific to children and adolescents with disabilities, and a need to revise and reconsider the benchmarks in the global matrix. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Sharon. I am pleased to present on behalf of my team, the 2022 Israeli Active Play. There are several programs and organizations here in Israel that enable people with disability to engage in active play. Here are listed several of these organizations. The activities are designed for people with various types of disabilities, such as intellectual, communication, mental, and physical disabilities. Here again, you can see the list of activities. Most programs are conducted jointly with peers without disabilities. Activities are diverse and consist of ball games and also challenging outdoors uh, sports activities. The age of participa participants in the various activities starts as early as the kindergarten. Most activities continue into adulthood. Finally, most activities are appropriate for use with moderate to high functioning level. Some activities are also designed for people with low functioning levels. I would like to give example of activities of three different organizations, and we will start with Edgarim. There are approximately 5,000 children and 1,000 adults that take part in Edgarim, and there are 1,200 volunteers. They have various challenging activities in Edgarim, like scuba diving, hiking, sailing, water skiing, kayaking, and also summer camps. And here you can see snapshots of the different activities conducted by Edgarim. The next organization is Cramble Wings. The meaning of the word Cramble, Cramble is actually this sweet uh, dessert that you see on the left side. It is a youth movement for children and youth with and without special needs. There are 9,000 members in Cramble Wings and 92 branches nationwide. They do various types of activities. Here you can see activities conducted during the summer camp of the Cramble Wings. And that is all. Thank you very much. Finland's 2022 para-report card gathers research results on the status and promotion of physical activity among Finnish children aged 7 to 18. Disability classification was based on the disability, functional difficulty or educational status. There was data for grading for eight of the ten indicators and sedentary behavior and physical fitness were graded as incomplete. Indicators grades range from the lowest of active play D to the highest of government A-. The overall physical activity was C+, organized sport C, active transportation B, family and peers C+, school B, and community and environment C-. Active transportation refers to commuting everyday distances with muscle power. The distance between home and school affects the choice of transportation. Thus, we have slightly modified the criteria, which was the percent of children who live less than 5 km from school and who make their commute to school actively, either on foot or by bike. Two-thirds of the children with disabilities actively commute to school if the distance is no more than 5 km. Active transportation is less common in the winter. Many get a ride in the winter and lose the benefits of active transportation. Many also switch from biking to walking, and this is especially in the case with girls. The promotion of active transportation by schools requires cooperation and a wide-ranging cross-administrative approach in municipalities and at the government level. Since 2018, Yamk University, with a network of Finnish cycling municipalities, has been coordinating a national program called Active Way to School. It offers information and advice for the planning and implementation of a smarter ways of getting to school. Hello everybody, 
My name is Jose Francisco Lopez Hill, and I am the Para Report Card Leader from Spain. First of all, I would like to thank you the opportunity to show my country results in this webinar. In this slide, on the left, you have the complete team of researchers who have conducted the first Para Report Card in Spain. On the right, you have the QR code that you can scan to download the full text uh, to learn more about the current situation of Spanish children and adolescents living with disabilities. In this slide, you can see the main results. The grades for all indicators range from incomplete to C+. The government indicator received the highest grade with a C+, while the community and environment indicator the lowest grade with an F. On the other hand, the central behaviors indicator obtained a C minus, the overall physical activity indicator received a D minus, and the school indicator a D. In addition, an incomplete grade was assigned to organized sport participation, active play, active transportation, physical fitness, and family and peace indicators because of insufficient data. Among these indicators, we highlight the sedentary behaviors indicator, which is based on the proportion of children and adolescents living with disabilities meeting with the Canadian sedentary behavior guidelines, which recommend no more than two hours of daily screen time in this population. In Spain, data from the Spanish National Health Survey indicate that only 41.4% of children and adolescents living with disabilities met with the international screen time recommendation. And these results suggest that we are having success with only about half of children and adolescents in our country. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any doubt, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the Irish Para Physical Activity Report Card. I'm presenting today on behalf of the authors, Quack, myself, Wesley O'Brien, Lauren Rodriguez, Marie Murphy, and Angela Carlin. For the Power Report card, we used a variety of national data sets, and we used the most recent versions of these data sets. We were able to get sufficient data for eight of the 10 indicators. For example, for overall physical activity, Children and adolescents with disabilities on the island of Ireland received an F grade, which is lower than the C minus grade given in the general physical activity report card. On a more positive note, under community and environment and government, children and adolescents with disabilities received a B minus and a B grade respectively. We had incomplete data for active play and the physical fitness indicators. For family and peers, which I'm going to focus on for the next minute, uh, children and adolescents with disabilities received a C grade. This data came from the GUI and the CISPA datasets. Now there's five indicators for the family and peers indicator, sorry, five benchmarks, and we had data on three of these benchmarks. But we primarily relied on the fact that the majority of children and adolescents with disabilities in Ireland reported participation in physical activity with family and peers in the community. And the stakeholders agreed on us there and they suggested that children and adolescents with disabilities in Ireland do have support of families and peers who are able to co-engage in physical activity in the community. And a lot of these specific opportunities are thanks to our sport inclusion disability officers, thanks to the work of CORA. So they are the results from Ireland. Hello, I am Rata Bozerenia from Lithuanian Sports University, and today I would like briefly to present physical activity para report card for children and adolescents with disabilities in Lithuania. From 10 indicators, we had enough data to grade only for organized sport participation, receive grade F, school grade D, community and environment grade D, and government grade C. 
If we are talking about organized sport participations, only 400 children with disabilities participated in sports clubs for the disabled twice a week and are forced in competitions, but there is no data about inclusive sports. In schools, general physical education classes participated around 80 of all students with disabilities. And when we're talking about community and environment, we need to stress that in Lithuania there are 84 sport schools, but only 360 children and youngsters with disabilities participated in sport activities organized by these schools. Because of that, we need to stress that children and adolescents with disabilities had a lot of possibilities to participate in physical education classes, but there is no enough possibilities to participate in physical activity and sport after schools. When we're talking ab about government, there are a lot of legal acts to increase physical activity and support children and youth with disabilities in this field, but we need still to develop a very good monitoring system for implementations of legal acts. And let me come back to indicators. We would like to stress incomplete indicator family. In Lithuania, family members still thinking that the best physical activity are in rehabilitation settings. Thank you for attention. Good day, everyone. On behalf of the Active Healthy Kids Philippines, I am honored to share with you the results from the first Philippine Para Report Garden Physical Activity for Children and Adolescents with Disabilities. As an overview, I will provide a summary of the results and briefly discuss the issue of data gap as demonstrated in our country report. To summarize, only organized sport and physical activity and government were successfully evaluated. The rest of the indicators were graded incomplete due to the limited availability of national level data. And while government policies exist to support the implementation of physical activity programs, the extent of uptake, implementation, and evaluation is poorly documented. These findings highlight the issue of data gap and its impact on the evaluation of the physical activity indicators in the Philippine context. First, there is disparity in the extent of research programs and evaluation strategies undertaken between Filipino children and adolescents with and without disabilities. The lack of comprehensive data to inform the evaluation of the indicators also underscores the need for thorough strategies in conducting research, regular census, and program evaluations. Specific implementation and evaluation plans that are aligned with international PA benchmarks should also be prioritized. Finally, collaboration with families, healthcare professionals, schools, communities, and the government is warranted. So stakeholders are knowledgeable of the benchmarks and are engaged in the evaluation of the PA indicators. To end this presentation, the results of the first Philippine Para Report card provide a snapshot of the state of evidence on the PA indicators, which future programs and studies in the country can build upon. Maraming salamat po. Hi everyone, my name is Diego Silva. I'm an associate professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil, as well as the leader of the party podcast for physical activity in Brazil and children and adolescents. It is with great pleasure that I present the results of the physical activity cares of the Brazil. A group of Brazilian experts compiled the best evidence based on information from research developed in Brazil and children and adolescents with disabilities. All information from Brazil can be seen in detail in the paper that there is published in an updated physical activity quarter. In Brazil, the grades for these indicators can be found in the table. For the overall physical activity, active play, active transportation, sedentary behaviors, physical fitness, and family impaired indicators, we had sufficient data to assign a grade. Because many studies were conducted in only one city of the country, which does not allow to generalize the results for the whole of Brazil. For the organized sports and physical activity indicator, the grade was F, which means that more children should play sports in the country. For the school indicator, 
the grade was B minus. While for the governance indicator, the grade was D. In summary, we needed more attention to physical activity indicators among children and adolescents with disabilities in Brazil. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Salome Aubert and I will present a brief overview of the findings from the from France 2022 Power Report Card. Uh, so overall, uh, F was assigned to three behavioral uh, indicator, overall uh, physical activity, organized sports and physical activity, and sedentary behaviors. Uh, better grades were assigned to three source of influence indicator. So a B plus was assigned to school, and C plus was assigned to community and environment, and to government indicator. And there was a lack of evidence uh, to evaluate in great active play, active transportation, physical fitness, fa and family and peers. So these indicators received an incomplete grade. So let's focus a bit more on the school indicator and what's behind this B plus grade. In France, all children, all children and adolescents with a disability included in mainstream school system are expected to attend the same amount of physical education class as children and adolescents without disabilities. So three hours uh, per week in primary school, three to four hours in secondary school, and two hours in high school. And all physical education class in middle school and high school are taught by a physical education specialist. But we still want to highlight that we had no data, uh, no available data confirming the actual active participation of children and adolescents with disability uh, in physical education class. In special education and health institution, physical education is mandatory and taught by a trainer, by a trained physical education teacher or by an adapted physical activity specialist. Uh, only 1% of uh, children and adolescents with disability uh, were registered to sports uh, club in 2019, uh, 20, for the school year 2018-2019. And all the schools are expected to have sports facilities complying with accessibility norms in compliance with the 2005 law for equity and rights and opportunities. In conclusion, we identified several priorities to advance physical activity promotion for this specific population, which are including a representative sample of children and adolescents with disabilities in national surveys, uh, the systematic evaluation of physical activity policies and programs, and increasing support of adapted physical activities uh, for children and adolescents with disabilities. And you can learn more uh, about this uh, in this open access uh, publication for, that was published in December last year. A big thanks to Charlotte, Jill and Jeremy for their contribution. Hello, my name is John Min Lee and thank you very much for inviting me to present a reserve from the South Korean 2022 Power Report Card and Fiscal Activity for Children and Adolescents with Disabilities. Um, we have used uh, several national data to investigate the indicators of overall PA, organized sports and PA, active transportation and physical fitness, and uh, additional indicator of sleep. So those are the each data and what we have invested in, in indicators. And also for the government uh, and strategy and investment, we have used the health enhancing fiscal activity policy or the tool and scoring rubrics to uh, 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 visiting annual financial report and annual budget plan and official documents uh, from the ministry official website. So therefore that our result have uh, uh, concluded overall PA for D plus, Organized sports and PA D minus, active transportation D minus, physical fitness D plus, government strategy and investment A plus, and additional indicator sleep for C minus. So there's a huge discrepancy between PA behaviors and government strategy and investments were founded among South Korean children and adolescents with disabilities. Uh, we have seen this because of in 2005, the uh, responsible for sports and PA for people with disabilities moved from the Ministry of Health and Welfare to Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, which that is symbolized as sports for people with a disability was seen as sports itself and not as an act of providing welfare and medical service. So therefore, uh, there's many, uh, the budget has been increases and uh, the many actions and program has developed by the government 
to promoting the physical activity and sports participation in South Korea. And the conclusion is uh, the South Korean children with the disabilities were not sufficiently physically active, but the government strategies and investment appear to be supportive and well established for children with the disabilities. And it clearly suggests that systemic and policy level endeavor have not yet been translated into behavior among children with the disability in South Korea. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Wendy Wong from Hong Kong Baptist University. On behalf of the team, I'm very glad to present the 2022 Active Healthy Kids Hong Kong Power Report Card on Physical Activity for Children and Adolescents with Special Educational Needs. Hong Kong Power Report Card consists of nine indicators. Five of them are behavior indicators while the other four are contextual factors that influence these behaviors. This table presents the grades for the indicators based on the evidence meeting the benchmarks. Four indicators were assigned a letter grade. Overall physical activity received the lowest grade F based on the mix of device measured and self-reported data. Active transportation and sedentary behaviors were graded D minor and D respectively. Sedentary behavior were graded based on device measured data exclusively. Government strategies and investments received a grade C+, plus, which is the highest among all indicators. The remaining five mm. indicators, including organized sport participation, active play, family and peers, school, and community and environment, mm. could not be graded due to insufficient data. Compared with the 2019 Power Report Card, sedentary behaviors deteriorated, while government strategies and investment showed improvement from C- minor to C+. From now on, I will focus on the government indicator. Benchmarks used to assign grade for this indicator include the evidence of leadership and commitment in providing physical activity opportunities for all children and adolescents, allocate funding and resources for the implementation of physical activity promotion, demonstration of policymaking process. Nine data sources were used to assign grade for government indicator. A summary of this evidence are listed in these two slides. For example, Leisure and Cultural Services Department provided half rate concessions for people with disabilities for participating in sport programs. Home Affair Bureaus provided diversified sport training programs and tailor made programs for students from special education. Education Bureau and Home Affairs Bureau jointly implemented the opening up school facilities for promotion of sport development scheme, including special school. The Education Bureau also updated the policy to emphasize the provision of equal educational opportunities for students with special educational needs to participate in physical education. In terms of the funding and expenditure, the government has slightly increased the proportion allocated specifically to people with disability from 4.9% in 2015 to 6% in 2020. For more information, please visit our website and recent publication in Adapted Physical Activity Quarterlies. You're also welcome to contact the project leader, Professor Cindy C. We would like to thank all the stakeholders who were involved in the grading assignment process. Thank you very much for your attention. Welcome, everyone. Hey, just before I press the start button for Shaika's presentation, I just uh, want to just thank everybody from the, the countries to have presented the, the country reports. So just uh, quickly going on to the last presentation uh, that we have before we go uh, forwards into the session. Uh, to this presentation of the matrix results and uh, SWOT analysis um, of the Power Report cards, children and adolescents with disabilities. I and Brooke have prepared this presentation and we would like to address our gratitude to all the leaders and teams uh, who enabled the creation and utilization of this data. And uh, we follow 
uh, this uh, presentation in this order, first an overview of the results uh, of the report card, and then we will demonstrate the information synthesis uh, that was gathered based on the SWOT uh, analysis uh, in each country. You may be able to see in the head of print section of the adapted physical activity uh, quarterly uh, the full uh, papers and uh, if we look at the data sources uh, which these uh, countries uh, have used and uh, we can see uh, here uh, across the different IFAP regions we can see a variety of uh, data sources and uh, the majority have used the uh, government or policy reports and others uh, were, uh, for example, disability specific research reports or physical activity surveys with some disability uh, disaggregation. If we look at the grades in each of the countries across the indicators, we also see a large variety uh, with a majority uh, of uh, grades uh, were uh, inconclusive, which means that uh, most of the outcomes were unfortunately inconclusive or uh, that the uh, indicators were graded as failed, very low, uh, below 30 percent uh, or as uh, d minus and very few had uh, higher outcomes such as uh, a uh, only korea and finland regarding the government indicator here we can see how the uh, indicators spread across the IPAP regions with the uh, israel majority of indicators uh, which were graded and the Philippines only with two uh, indicators graded. Regarding the SWOT analysis, this is a framework which utilizes uh, uh, information regarded to internal origin, as, and this is categorized into strengths and weaknesses, and to external origin, which is categorized into opportunities and threats. And the teams were asked uh, to refer to it in their our report cards. Here is the uh, interpretation uh, of these uh, uh, outcomes. And we can see that uh, some countries did not interpret it with regard to the uh, SWOT analysis framework at all. Others uh, referred to it in a narrative uh, format others use the SWOT matrix format, and some uh, use the SWOT, the SWOT as uh, only as uh, headlines. Then uh, we moved to a complex process, Delphi process, for agreeing on the frame, on the framework of the current report card interpretation. And for this, we have used the expert group of seven all of them authors involved in the power podcast from five countries. And we decided on utilizing the International Classification of Functions and Disability, the ICF, as the main framework, as theoretical uh, frame of reference uh, for uh, the analysis. The group met three times online and followed the Delphi process for agreeing on uh, how we align, identifying the line, the uh, physical activity indicators and benchmarks with the ICF uh, components. Finally, we use a deductive and inductive thematic analysis uh, of the text included in the interpretation sections, and this was done by Quagner and myself. Here are the results. Uh, we saw that uh, three components of ICF uh, we could align uh, some of the indicators into them. Body and function and structure was physical fitness, activity and participation, basically the other behavioral 
um, indicators and environmental factors that were fairly similar to the environmental indicators. And here we can see in each of these components how we structure the SWOT analysis with the different themes. We see, for example, no strengths and opportunities, body function and structure, and related to the teams and body and function structures. Whereas in activity and participation, we see teams that vary in different countries from strengths to weaknesses, and quite similarly also in the environmental contextual factors. Based on this, we could do the summarizing description where we can see that, for example, fitness, we have only weaknesses and strengths. And there are in the activity and participation, we see also some strengths, but also weaknesses in each of professional development, equipment facilities, program availability in community and schools. And we can see also some additional external important uh, issues referring to the threats, weather, Olympic inspiration and opportunity, and local transport and other threat. Uh, and all of these uh, teams were also related somehow to the environmental factors. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, there is a global perspective uh, which has been provided by five of the seven regions of uh, the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. Generally, we can say that the uh, grades of our podcast were lower than those in the Global Matrix 4, uh, based on Silver al This in outcome is with and very similar to evidence uh, that is already available. For example, the paper of Martin Guinness et al. Um, and also, uh, we can see that the uh, other papers of Carthy and Smith refer to uh, the risk of physical inactivity in children and adolescents uh, with disability. In the overriding team, uh, describe the lack of data and the need for more accurate and comprehensively estimation of the degree of fitness and physical activity participation. This is very, very important to find a way how to uh, address uh, this factor and knowledge in this regard. Uh, perhaps a better, uh, well powered uh, and representative samples could be a way. And that also we need uh, more uh, instruments. Although there are some instruments available, and we need to find those who are feasible. And there was no consensus and strengths. We did see weaknesses in those important factors, program availability, equipment, facility, and professional development. And we did see some interesting opportunities regarding a public inspiration, meaning that there are inspirational speakers among the retired athletes in particular, and there are also initiatives such as Paralympic Sports Day or reverse integration workshops that could be used to increase this inspiration, but hopefully also the participation. There are also threats such as extreme weather conditions, and decision makers should provide more indoor facilities to cope with it, also more adapted equipment, and also the issue of transportation, which appears to be too efficient and uh, reduce the need for physical uh, activity, and therefore maybe some local stranding opportunities for active food and hand cycling devices may be a good idea. We would like to thank you for your attention and invite you for the uh, full issue uh, of adaptive physical activity, which will include all this information. And I would like to invite you to the discussion uh, section. Okay, so um, those were our presentations for uh, the special issue.
now I'd like to invite uh, Catherine Carty from the UNESCO Chair uh, to share a few words as a discussant on what you've uh, just uh, had a first glimpse of, perhaps. Thank you, Kwok, um, for that. And thanks indeed to everybody who put who put together those presentations on each of the report cards. I mean, I, I just have to say it's such a fantastic wealth of information. And one thing that that we've realized working in the area of, of disability sport um, and disability physical activity is that there is constant criticism of the lack of good quality data in this area to inform practice. And I think what this exercise and special issue has presented is a fantastic um, overview of the current status within the 14 countries and indeed in the global matrix. And I think um, it's a really, really important asset uh, for policymakers and for many others uh, for now and into the future. So congratulations to everyone who's been involved in, in putting together this special issue because it's it's hugely important and very, very valuable information from an ad advocacy perspective, but also just to lay down the, the benchmark and the status quo in relation to these areas, uh, this area of, of disability and physical activity at this time. Um, well done also to Human Kinetics for, for waiving the fee on open, open access for this, because that's also critically important. Um, and uh, and very very welcome to see that as well. So I guess from from our perspective in the UNESCO chair, when the chair was established, which is ten years ago now this year, the kind of core focus area was disability inclusion, which has been a little bit extended to include other marginalised groups since 2017. But on the disability inclusion agenda, really all the global reports that we've seen launched since 2015 have prioritised disability inclusion and equal access as core policy areas. And I think we saw in the presentations there the importance, you know, um, at government level, uh, the indicators that that and the gradings at government level were all were often higher in those reports than the um, kind of practice um, grades that were given. So demonstrating the policy practice gap that we see internationally, I suppose, as well at national level. So while it's been really welcome since 2015 that there has been a spotlight on disability inclusion and equity and reduced inequalities in um, the kind of main international policy areas, we see that reflected as well at the moment in, 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 in turning that into what's happening in practice on the ground. But actually, the spotlight on this area has been a really important focus since 2015, and it was the sustainable development agenda, I think, that motivated um, and built a huge momentum around this area again in policy. So we see it in WHO's um, global action plan and the subsequent guidelines and Kwok, you mentioned the disability specific guidelines that emerged as well. Uh, we also see it in UNESCO's Kazan action plan uh, and they are refocusing in June of this year as well around how Kazan action plan will mobilize again following the next conference of sports ministers which, which happens this June. But again disability inclusion is very much prioritized in that and in their quality physical education um, initiative and the UNDESA's uh, work on sports for development and peace as well prioritizes disability inclusion so it has been a priority area but i do agree as was as came out from those presentations that we just saw that there is this policy practice gap and we need to put a huge emphasis on bridging that gap at this point i think it's positive that the focus is on this area but it needs now to be kind of mobilized and activated so I mentioned the SDGs and at country level as well, there's been a lot of focus. Ireland is up for review this year in the voluntary national review um, at the high level political forum in the UN. And, you know, again, looking at sport as, as part of as an enabler, I suppose, of sustainable development has really gained traction over the last number of years. So many UN agencies are using sport. You mentioned UNICEF there. They're looking at sport and inclusive sport um, to enable health and social and development outcomes and realization of human rights as well. So that has put a priority on this field as well. Um, both the human rights mechanisms, you mentioned CRPD, but indeed some of the other uh, treaties as well, and the sustainable development goals, call on countries to invest in data and, uh, and data. Um, and what we do know is when it comes to disability, there is a lack of disaggregated data at country level and a lack of prioritization of this area. 
the main priority, a main priority and principle of the Sustainable Development Goals is furthest behind first. So this would indicate that in the coming years, we really need to refocus our investment into the data gaps that came out in the in the 14 reports and country studies that were just mentioned there and that on in order to move forward and in order to say that we're developing we need to look at those who are as as they say in the sustainable development goals furthest behind first and in many countries those with disabilities are among the the furthest behind or the ones who for whom investment has not been prioritized and this includes in the area of data also in the capacity building and so some of the other factors that we see contributed to the the gap in participation for people with disabilities so there really is that uh, international prioritization around investing in those furthest behind first in the data and the other factors that are needed to overcome the barriers that mean it's more difficult for people with disabilities to participate one thing that I noticed from, from the presentations and, and indeed from the authors of the, the papers is the huge work that has been put in by universities across the world to bridge this gap. So, you know, like a lot of the kind of provision of physical activity for people with disabilities, it is enshrined in, in, in CRPD and, and, and other areas as well. Um, and that puts an onus on the state within countries to really invest in enabling people with disabilities to realize their human rights. But what we've seen from this um, special issue and from these reports is that universities have driven this initiative. And in fairness, I think that's um, huge kudos to the, the higher education sector and the university sector around the world for producing this really valuable uh, set of information and, and matrix of information for this area. And I think it's really up to governments to also get behind and support some of the outcomes that we've seen there and that were just mentioned in terms of the gaps, the data gap and, and state, states meeting their responsibilities in terms of addressing some of the data gaps there. Um, from, from a university perspective, it very much shows us universities meeting what, what's you know, um, I suppose their public sector duty, as it's called in Ireland, has a similar name in many other countries, but really contributing to the evidence evidence base and the data gaps that we see. So I think that's been a huge, hugely positive. This whole series is hugely positive for universities and the series can be used for advocacy at state level, I would say, to try and address some of the gaps that, that we've seen um, forecast or highlighted there. Actually, in many countries, it was the government uh, indicator that scored the highest. Um, so really, there is a need now for the governments to step up and implement the policies. So I think, you know, as, a, as again, the whole issue as an advocacy tool has huge value and huge weight. So I know there are questions popping up there and I'm not going to eat into the time uh, for the Q&A. So absolutely fantastic resource. Well done, Quack, for organizing this event today as well. And well done to everyone who contributed to the special issue. It's a it's a massively important, I think, um, benchmark now that we can that can be used for multiple purposes to advance practice. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for your thoughts and your sharing knowledge your, your wealth of knowledge in this and the current current issues at the moment uh, so uh, hopefully we, we can all move forwards with this um i'm going to hand over now to farad who will uh who will uh, take us into the last uh, 15 minutes of this session for some questions and answers um so uh, over to you farad Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Fareed Bardet. I'm from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, and uh, I'm here to help moderate the Q&A uh, uh, round now. Um, I think if I remove this, yeah, so all the panelists are here, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kwok, for also leading the Global Matrix and all the report card leaders that have uh, put all their work in terms of gathering the data. I know that can be quite challenging. Also, I would like to thank APAC for hosting the, the special issue. Um, so some, some questions have already been answered, answered in writing. Um, one of the questions uh, I will first start off with is uh, perhaps for Dr. Uh, for, for Dr. Ng uh, Kwok. What are the lessons learned from this initiative? Well, yeah, so the lessons in this is that um, um, 
Well, th there's there's actually quite a lot from a, from a point of view of actually getting people together to the point of actually the end result of the, the data that we have. So um, there's there's multiple levels to really answer to this. If I just focus on the actual, the lessons learned from what we found in terms of the, the grades and each of the countries, um, I think um, we can see that there's a lot of countries which doesn't have, uh, don't feel comfortable in grading uh, on these benchmarks. So, um, the, um, I think there's a there's a need to communicate more with other groups of people who do uh, do take data collection. We've seen through the presentations different types of data sources. We've seen what Schaiker showed from the table of the the most common ways of of the people who have collected the data for these grades, and um, and I think more needs to be done along that kind of line there. So th th those those lessons need to be taken into consideration for for how to collect data and um, and how to uh, make sure that people with disabilities are not invisible in relation to data collection and um, and we can see that it's uh, perhaps I'll just go back to my first kind of presentation of UNESCO uh, of showing the report the fact sheets and arguably. I think they're right in the sense of not putting a fact sheet on physical activity because if you look at the our figure in the in the paper, we've got red colors to demonstrate countries with grades, and then we've got gray areas where we just don't have any um, countries that have provided grades. There's a lot more gray areas than red areas, and what that means is that um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned to take this going going forwards. And I think they're kind of right, but I think we also need to work with organizations like them. So physical activity data is also included in their types of data collection. Thank you very much, Quark. Um, another question from uh, Xiao Wei Feng, um, asking about whether the low physical activity in school, family, or community settings is because of the lack of coordination uh in family professional partnerships does any of the panelists want to answer shaika yeah maybe i will uh, uh, give a short uh, comment to, to this question uh, it appears to me uh, that uh, the one of the major uh, outcomes of uh, this uh, series of studies uh, has been the gap gap between uh, what we know that needs to be done and what has actually been done in uh, actually in all countries it's not only in uh, developing countries that we see gaps it's also in very well-developed countries, such as Canada, the United States, even in Finland, you were speaking about gaps uh, between what could have been done and what is uh, actually the, the state of the art. So it appears that there is need for thinking how to disseminate the information and uh, and make it uh, user friendly. Apparently, we uh, academics, uh, professionals, uh, we share the knowledge, but this knowledge does not come to those who are expected to use it, such as in the case of the question, the families, uh, the communities, uh, the service giver, uh, service providers in the communities. So we really need to find the way how to uh, condense our knowledge into uh, such uh, uh, contents uh, which are easy to chew uh, by the uh, service recipients. Thank you, Shaika. 
it's a very good uh, very good response and something to think about in terms of how we can uh, translate our um, research or any evidence to to practice and and collaborate with the different partners in practice a question for um catherine uh, from yogesh chander can we design courses for adapted physical education on a collaborative basis yeah um there are a few courses out there we have there have been some courses and programs developed in, in the past that are you know freely av available that can be shared um there are definitely modules that we can share so we have a few we have a program called um ipepas inclusive physical education physical activity and sport it's freely available we've run it in some countries around the world with partners and some partners have also taken it on board and run it themselves in country um so i know you're talking about india is it so um i know we've we've given a number of uh, or delivered a number of sessions in India, but th that that's one program. We also have another one on inclusive physical education that's that's linked to that. Um, and there there is a joint program being developed at the moment on a European level, but it's open to people in other countries as well. Um, and we're hoping that that will start in possibly January 2025. Um, I'd say with with IFAPA's collaboration, Quack, there, there may well be opportunities to look at something collaborative that might be available broadly. I'm sure um, that that is something that could be looked at, but there are a huge range of resources available um, freely available for universities to engage with. And definitely our, we have a few, uh, one would be IPEPAS and Trust and UNESCO have quality physical education uh, guidelines and, and practice initiatives linked with their Fit for Life uh, program, which is very much based on inclusive practice as well. Um, and I do think that we'll see more and more re resources come into play. I definitely don't think there's a need to develop too much more it's work together share what we do have be collaborative and i think one thing around the adapted physical activity community globally is that they are it's a very collaborative group who are willing to share share res resources that we have and share practice um you know so i think there's lots that can be done and lots of people that you can liaise with to, to try and see what's needed so if you want to follow up with with me on, on email around your specific requirements i'd be happy to uh, to follow up with you on that but i i guess there would be openness uh quack from an ifapa point of view to look at something uh collaboratively that could that could be put together thank you very much catherine I uh, just saw another question uh, regarding uh, that's kind of following from the report from the Philippines about how the grades can actually be improved. I think this might be a question that is relevant not only to the Philippines, but all countries in terms of how can what can we do to empower more children with disabilities to be physically active. I will leave this open to anyone who wants to respond, anyone from the panelists. Can I come in on that? Yes, Catherine. So I think um, we have to empower a lot of people, not just you know the children with disabilities. I think there are a lot of of professionals as well who input into this space. When you look across the range of of, of barriers faced by children with disabilities in accessing physical activity opportunities in their school, in their community. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that fix that that fit into um, addressing those barriers who would all need to be, I suppose, in, in some respects, upskilled around how to overcome some of the barriers that children face to enable more access for children to sport and physical activity in their community, in their school, as part of their family and in other areas. So I think one one factor here as well goes back to maybe, again, universities and and perhaps a need to grow um the prevalence of adapted physical activity programs across the university uh, infrastructure globally to ensure that we have enough professionals who can feed into developing the capacity um across various different areas where people want to access physical activity and sport um 
you know, so there's a little bit of a, a backfill needed for people who are in workplaces, be it in local government, local authority, to raise more awareness of the issues that are, that are faced by people in their communities that can be addressed by, by school authorities, by local government um, and by other stakeholders around that. But I definitely think we need to ensure that programmes that look at physical activity, sport, physical education, um, need to ensure that adapted physical activity and addressing the needs of people with disabilities and children with disabilities is part and parcel of those programs. And what's very important in those programs is that that inclusion of that component in the modules is practical and that it's it's participatory and it's linked people with disabilities are participating in that learning process as well. So with those partnerships with community groups um, of children and adults indeed with disabilities as part of the educational process of, of pre-vocational pre -vocational training of people who are going to work in physical education and sport is critically important. And unfortunately, in some countries, we're seeing a decline in the number of programmes that are covering this area. So there's definitely a need for further investment in that area to ensure that um, people's hu human rights can be realised in and through sport. So huge amount of capacity building still needed there and greater levels of government awareness to invest in that as well. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, I will follow up with uh, one last question. Uh, and that kind of builds quite well on what Catherine uh, is promoting. And I think we all kind of share that. Uh, what are the next priorities to expand on this initiative and help meet its goals? Uh, I'm looking at Quark, but others can uh, respond as well. Um, okay, well, I'm going to try to answer your question by asking a question, um, and I'm going to direct that question to Justin, because uh, Justin's the, the editor-in-chief, and it's very, very supportive actions from APAC. We wouldn't really be here if it wasn't for, for APAC, and um, so um, I kind of would like to ask what is his thoughts about um, um, the kind of support from APAC for doing this again? If we were to do it again and what would the priorities be from his point of view from the researchers uh point of view for for uh, for, for another special issue what is his what are your thoughts on next priority steps and uh, for another special issue are you asking are you asking about what the what apac's view or what i mean i can't speak on the journal in general but what my my view as editor would be if um, another version of this would come out, or what priorities are there for the journal generally? Yeah, so maybe the first, the priorities for another special issue. So it it wouldn't necessarily. I don't know whether it makes sense to just reinvent the wheel without there being a a, a set of priorities led by the readership potentially that would fit within the the journal that kind of thing. Yeah, I think. Um, we, we do receive quite a few special issue um, proposals uh, with APAC. And what we do with each of them is we share them if they're within the scope of the journal with our with our editorial board and our emeritus editors like Shaky, who's uh, got his hand raised. I think that might be a high five coming from him. Um, but with that, um, the hope in the future is not to continue to do the same research and publish the same stuff over and over again. Um, I think we do have a history of doing that, not just in adapted physical activity as a field, but uh, in research generally in physical activity research. Um, the idea is to move and push the field forward and bring new and sometimes controversial ideas to the table. And so if there is interest in um, another special issue with APAC, I would personally prioritize those that bring new, innovative, and perhaps uh, controversial ideas to the table that help to develop and shape the way we think as a field um, in new ways. Now, I can't tell you what that means because I think a very specific way currently, and my thinking is shaped by my experiences within the field. I think there are a lot of other people who um, have more innovative thoughts than I do, and that's why we um, solicit and receive special issue requests. Um, it shouldn't, in my view, be generated from my own personal thoughts, but rather from the field and from people within the field. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Justin. Uh, I see that 
Yuri has uh, raised his hands and Shaika and Katrin as well. Shaika will was first, I think. Shaika, you want to pitch in? Um, you're on mute at the moment. Uh, okay. Having been both uh, a FAPA editor and the IFAPA president in the past, uh, it is my opinion, which is quite similar to what Justin had just said, is that uh, it is less uh, appropriate for APEC to uh, produce another special issue, which happens very rarely for in, in APEC anyway, uh, on the same topic. However, I think that uh, IFAPA, as an organization that uh, nurtures this kind of uh, endeavors, uh, should find a way, uh, while IFAPA has very limited resources, to uh, try to find a way to cooperate with uh, organization, to generate some funding, uh, and to develop uh, uh, special international uh, project, perhaps with the help of uh, UNESCO, um, uh, because it is really an issue. It's an issue which I think all of us uh, um, agree that it is extremely important and uh, has a major uh, health impact on, uh, on a large uh, part of the population, uh, let's say 15% at least, and in the future, even more. So uh, I think this is the direction we should proceed. Thank you, Shaika. Uh, then I think it was Katrin. Katrin, you've raised your hand as well. Um, I just raised my hand to say that, like, I think what's hello. been hello. already is a massively important piece of work that a lot can be done with to advocate for some of what's, I suppose, come out as some of the reports there, you know, and I think you, there's a lot that can be done with this as an advocacy tool to reach out beyond the university networks into the government stakeholders and other areas to really leverage what you've got in this asset that you now have. I mean, a huge amount of work has gone into this. It's hugely valuable. It doesn't exist. People have been very critical of the lack of disability related data in this field for years, and you now have a huge a body of work that shows some some well not so many strengths definitely a lot of areas to work on and i think that in this year of all years with a a world conference of sports ministers coming up in june as well you can use that to maybe get into other stakeholders get this publication into the hands of stakeholders beyond the university networks who can hopefully fill some of the gaps that are needed at this stage Thanks, Catherine. Uh, very good point uh, the, that this can really serve as a good advocacy tool, strong advocacy tool. Um, Yuri, I think you've raised your hands. Is that right? I, am, I'm, I'm, I did. <laughs> um, very short comment. First of all, um, I congratulate you for a fantastic job. I mean, what I heard today is, is, is something so valuable for me and for XPE. And I would like to propose that we get the information presented today and we put it on our website and we reach out to all our members uh, in order for them to learn about what you have accomplished and what you have presented. I think this is of utmost importance in order for us to get more countries, more organizations, more universities involved in, fu in future projects of this kind. And, and finally, uh, I would like to uh, add to Catherine, I think a presentation of what has been presented today at minute seven in Baku is of utmost importance. I think it will give idea to the ministers uh, responsible of sport a great understanding of what has been done so far and what needs to be done in the coming years. And those who were not part of the project might ask you how can they join and, 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 and take it from here on. 
So congratulations for a job well done and for your initiatives and wonderful presentations. Good job. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, and I think that is a question that other attendees have asked about how they can get involved. And I'll leave that to Kwok at the end. But I think we have one uh, last person who has raised their hand. Uh, Salome, do you want to finish off before I, I hand back over to Kwok? Yes, it was just like a, in response to your, to your last question. And I completely agree with what Katie and Catherine and Yuri said. It was like just a now that all this work is done, like the work, a huge amount of work has been prepared uh, to have all of these reports sh shared today, but this work is not done. And now we it's the, the opportunity to build upon what has been done to advocate and to reach out. And for all the countries that developed a report card, this is a great opportunity to use the, the document, the, the presentation, the data they put together and to reach out to policymakers. And it's not easy, but this is really something that that can be done when you have like this work that is done, it is a really a great tool uh, to advocate and to try to create change and to try to, to build upon what was done, was done. Like we have, we have like a policy gap, but we also have data gap and research gap that needs to be filled. And, and so now it's opportunity uh, to like, there is still a lot of things to do. And, and when this work, like the, with the quality of the work has been presented today, it's also, it is also the opportunity to have more country joining in the future. And so, yeah, I think, I think we should really not see uh, the paper being published as the end of the work here and, and really just as the beginning of the advocacy for, for improving things. That's a good way to finish off this Q&A round. I would like to thank all the panelists for answering uh, the questions and helping us reflect on how we can move forward. Now I'll, I'll uh, give the reins back to Kwok, over to you. Thank you, Ferd, um, much appreciated. And I know we have a little bit over time, but I just wanted to share just two more things for you before we, we finish off. So first of all, there's some com common questions about where you can get more information. You go to the FAPA website, you go to latest resources and power report cards, then you would see uh, the list of all the papers in there. And when we populate it more, we'll see, you will see more of, the, um, more of the papers there. So if you highlight these blue areas, you get direct sources to each of the papers. Uh, it's a holding place with all of these up until the point when, uh, when the paper is actually uh, um, um, published. Um, and also, um, if you're still undecided, uh, and you would like to go to New Zealand, there is this conference here. Um, Early Bird closes at the end of this week, and um, um, hopefully uh, you would have like to, to, uh, to attend this uh, International Symposium of Adaptive Physical Activity. So those are my two, um, two extra plugs. I would like to thank every, extend my thanks to everyone again. Um, and in addition to the fact that you've all stayed um, for a little bit longer than we and had planned for and um and uh but and for now i'd like to uh close this session thank you very much we will be you there will be a survey for you to complete at the end of when this session closes there'll be a little window for feedback so please do um to complete that it's really important to know how you felt about the webinar and uh and there are other questions that we can try to respond to afterwards okay thank you very much everyone and uh um and take care, safe travels, safe evening, day and, and night. Uh, end webinar. Stop.